Hello everyone, welcome from the Peterson Automotive Museum. I'm Jason, the Director of Education here at the museum, and I'm standing in front of our vault, which is a collection of over 250 cars spread out over a city block size um, parking area. Today we are going to be looking at a little bit different segment than some of our previous videos. We are here and have in our collection some of the most iconic vehicles of history. The, the winners, the race winners, the, the great sellers and all that. But the history of the automobile would not be complete without also looking at some of those other cars. The ones that may not have won as many races or may not have even hit the factory floor. Today, we're gonna to be looking at what we may wanna call the failures, although they each have an interesting story to tell on their own. So join me as we go off to see the also rans and in times the never rans. So we will start right here at the beginning of the car. Just like every new item, new object, new good, new machine, whatever else, there's a cycle of innovation. Someone comes up with the idea and you get the early adopters, the early innovators in it, and soon you have all kinds of companies all wanting to take part in it, to where eventually you get that slough of um, disappointment where everything sorts itself out. Early days of the car, no different than any other good. You had all kinds of companies wanting to be a part of this, right? This particularly was true after Henry Ford in 1908 launches the Model T and turns the car from being a limited production good, largely tailoring to wealthy audiences, to a mass produced good. All kinds of people could make money then. So you had all kinds of companies form, including in 1909, the Demo car company, whose car was the Demo. Now this starts off with C.H. Ritter deciding he wants to be part of this new car craze and opens up a company and starts thinking of a name for it. And well, we're in Detroit, we make motor cars, maybe possibly we go by the Detroit Motor Car Company. Well, that doesn't have a lot of zing to it and it also opens up the possibility of confusion considering Henry Ford's first company had been the Detroit Automobile Company. So they're like, okay, what do we do with it? Detroit Motor Car, Detroit Motor Car. Ah, perhaps we just shorten it to be the Demo Car Company and we will name our car Demo. And to make sure everyone knows how to pronounce it, we will pronounce it, we will put a line above the O so it is clearly Demo because that has an added benefit in that it sounds French. Detroit, the Paris of the West, whole lot of attention on French history and the like in the area, and also early days of the car, France was where it was at for innovation and style and that. So slapping Demo on the front of this gave it an extra little panache. Snazzy car, whatever else, also marketed cheap. A Model T at this time would have been close to $900. You could have had this beauty for about 550, okay? All seemed great, perfectly set up to be the next four, the next one to take over. They open their doors in September of 1909. In August of 1910, less than a year later, they go bankrupt. And production of the vehicle right, winds down and they're done making cars by 1911. Their factory at 1305 Bellevue was then bought by Harry Ford. Not Henry Ford, Harry Ford, a completely unrelated um, Ford family person, um, not relation, no relation at all to Henry, but he goes off to start making cars in their old factory for Saxon. Demo wasn't the only one like this. There were all kinds of other companies formed. Some of them companies starting from scratch, others companies that had been around a while doing other things that decided to enter into the car fray. Babcock is an excellent example. This is the H.H. Babcock Carriage Company of Watertown, New York. Not to be confused with the Babcock Electric Carriage Company of Buffalo, New York. Similar names, completely separate companies. H.H. H. Babcock had actually started in the mid 1800s making carriages and they got pretty good at it and were fairly famed for their carriages. But 1900s hit, everyone realizes the carriage is on its way out, the future is on automobiles. So in 1908, they started producing cars. This happens to be in 1911 Babcock. Built in Watertown, New York, Somewhat um, cool because it actually survived living in upstate New York and all the weather and everything else. But the company itself would not survive long as far as a car maker. 
They stop automobile production in 1915, realize it's not smart to go back into carriage production, so what they decide to do instead is become a automotive body company, and they actually become fairly good at that. They become one of the leading suppliers of ambulance bodies during the First World War. Now, as you're learning, we're gonna be focusing on the companies themselves that were short-lived for the most part, a couple side stories and all that. If you get right down to it, many of the most famous car companies at some point fail, right? We have a limited set out there. So even though once in the day, companies like, as you look ahead, Duesenberg and the like, were, where was that? A lot of these companies don't survive the Depression or the World Wars, or Delahaye's on the other side, Delage's. These are all companies that are gone now, but we won't really consider them failures because in their day, they were really where it was at. It was just a matter of time of circumstances and time undermine them. Our focus today is largely on the ones that never really became the it thing. For example, Ruxton. This is a 1929 Ruxton. And the Ruxton goes down um, in fame largely because of some technological innovations it seems to bring, although they aren't necessarily the first. The story starts here with a gentleman by the name of William Muller. He is working for a company called the Bud Body Company that makes automotive bodies. And he has a plan, okay? He's an engineer for the firm, and he realizes that there's some new technologies coming out, okay? Among these, front wheel drive. Ruxton and Cord, which we'll mention in a second, um, get a lot of credit for being the first to front wheel drive, but that's among the American companies. France, here again, is where it's at for innovation. Tracta had largely developed a lot of the underlying um, technology of front-wheel drive in the, in the mid-20s. That's why a lot of front-wheel drive vehicles have a constant velocity joint in them known as a Tracta joint. So internationally, as far as the innovation, American companies were not first. But Ruxton was one of the first American companies to actually introduce it into their vehicles, if they existed. Moeller has the idea. They're not around yet. He needs to find money, and he has a perfect plan for his new idea of introducing a front-wheel drive um, vehicle into the American market, okay? He's going to design it, they're gonna sell it to an automaker, who then will contract with Bud Body, remember the company Moeller works for, to build the bodies for the car. Genius plan. However, he isn't able on his own. He's a good engineer, not necessarily the best marketer and all that. He isn't able to get it up and running. But there's someone else on the board uh, that works at Bud, he's actually on the board for Bud, named Archie Andrews. Archie Andrews is the one that has the marketing skills and more importantly has the connections. He also worked for, he also was on the board for a company known as Up Motor. So he uses the connections to go and try to market the car. No one wants it, still. They go through a series of companies looking for someone who would want to invest in this. Can't find anyone. At some point, they're like, well, let's just get the money to help build it. And they find an investor they think would be interested by the name of William Ruxton. They go so far as starting the company and naming it after Mr. Ruxton, who wanted nothing to do with it and actually gave them some legal trouble over the time because he didn't want his name attached to a car he had no, no, um, no role, no part to play in developing, okay? Eventually, um, Archie Andrews and William Moeller do find someone willing to build it, the Moon Motor Company out of St. Louis. Well, their progress is not as fast as Archie Andrews wants, so Archie Andrews starts buying up stock of the company to where eventually he's able to seize back control of the Ruxton, um, and the president of Moon Motors locks himself in his um, office in protest over the whole thing. Still not produced yet. By the early 30s, there, by early 1930, there is actually movement because most of the production plan had been taken over by Kissel Motors in Wisconsin. Great, it's finally someone to help build this car, which is fairly unique. It is a front wheel drive vehicle, allows it to be much lower. Average height of cars at the time about six feet. This is 54 inches high, okay? They painted in period colors and all that that were striking. Some of them got these wood light headlights, which striking, Art Deco cool and all that, not the best headlights, but they look stylish, so everyone wants them. Anyways, the Kissel Company begins producing them. Andrew's still not very happy with their progress, tries to pull the thing, the, whole, the same thing and start buying up their stock. Kissel, though, who reacts differently than Moon, they basically declare bankruptcy to block the whole thing, which ends the life story of the Ruxton after only 96 cars have been produced. 
So important in the um, history of American automotive innovation, not so relevant in terms of number of cars that hit the market. As we're walking by, we have a Cord L29, which actually beat the Rexton to the American market by a few weeks to be the first American-produced front-wheel drive vehicle. Then Duesenberg, which goes out of business in the 30s after dominating the market for luxury vehicles in America before then. Pierce Arrow, another early player founded by a company that had built bird cages. Innovators in style, first presidential cars were Pierce Arrows, but another company that did not survive the depression. Now we're entering into our outer vault. I'm going to return to the spot in just a second, but we may need to make a quick jaunt around the corner into our shop for a couple Southern California tales. I have two Southern California cars that fit well into this, the narrative we're setting up today. The first is a, 1920, um, a 1922 Leach. So Martin Leach was, in the early part of the last century, one of LA's primary car dealers. He was famous for the number of cars he could sell. He had basically um, taken over a lot of the market in, in town. Well, he got so enamored with his ability to sell cars, he decided, not only do I want to sell them, I want to make them. I want to design them, I want to build them and the like. And so he launches the Leach Company. He buys out a factory that had formerly been uh, owned by Harry Morgan, um, a famed race car designer of the day and everything else. Um, Harry Miller, sorry, not Morgan. Harry Miller, and decides to use that factory in Vernon to make his cars. He actually uses Harry Miller design straight six engines in them. And he does a lot to make it a California car, because that's his marketplace, that's what he knows, and that's what he thinks he can sell. The top that you're seeing right now is known as a California top. It's trying to balance the freedom and wind in your hair of an open top car with the comfort and weather protection of a hard top. And by trying to do both, it does neither perfectly, but hey, at least an attempt at something. You also have these lighted step plates that allow you to easily get in, not a full running board length, but the lighting helps give it a little extra panache. There's also inside, built into the dash, a cigar lighter, okay? He's trying to find little things that would add something extra to the car. So you get these, these added accoutrements, you get a Harry Miller design, straight six engine, and everything else. Leach feels he is perfectly set up to take over the LA market. The problem he faces is that the engines he was putting in were not the most reliable. Though into the fact that the top itself had issues with leakage and the like, all of his dreams never really came to be. The car didn't run or perform quite to the level it wanted. And so here, like many of our stories, the company goes out of business. There were only about 500 car leashes made by the end of the day. And we believe this is the only, if not the only, at least one of the only survivors. Right next to it, we're going to briefly jump ahead in time. This is a 1974 Dutcher, built by the Steam Motor Works out of San Diego. Early 70s, there's great discussion in California about smog. There's general interest in the country in fuel efficiency and the like. And there's, there's talk about getting past fossil fuels, right? A discussion we may hear of today that was going on 50 years ago. What had gone on is in the late 60s, a California congressman in state the state assembly had actually started proposing laws and all that that would ban gasoline-powered cars by the mid-70s. None of those really got off the ground, but it did start pushing regulators and the like into what can we do to try to solve the smog problem. And it was generally believed getting away from gasoline-powered vehicles would be the primary way of doing it. So the first steps they took were setting up steam-powered buses which works, and there was some progress made on getting some of those, but solving just the bus problem doesn't solve the majority of the issue because most people in California at the time were driving cars. 
So they put in a policy that would reward a company that would come up with a steam-powered option. Two companies signed up for the program. Aerojet out of Sacramento's plan was just to take an old Chevy Vega and repurpose it, get a steam engine in it. What Steam Motor Works did is they said, no, we're going to start from scratch. So they actually built a car from scratch, even though it has some stylings reminiscent of others. They actually started from the ground floor, so the car was built as a steam-powered vehicle from the get-go, not just retrofitted to be one. Well, kind of works. There are some benefits of steam. There's also some drawbacks, right? It's, it is less emissions than an internal combustion gasoline-powered car, but it's also not as, it, it needs a lot more fuel, right? So there wasn't a whole lot of development of it past this to begin resolving some of those problems, but it did at least demonstrate that, hey, cars could run on other things, even though we may need to think through with some of the technologies. Now join me back where we had left. So just we, as we talked about at the beginning, when you had the, the launch of the car, there were all kinds of companies that came into being, all wanting to get a piece of this new market. Eventually, you had had a series of consolidations, companies going out of business, mergers happening, everything else, that got you down to a core group. We think of the big three, but throw in Nash and some other companies. There was a few more. But anyways, there had been great consolidation. World War II comes along. And what winds up happening is this is going to completely shake up the industry because all those companies that had grown to dominate are now no longer making cars, they're off making war equipment, tanks and trucks and the like. Coming out of the war, you have huge amounts of pinup demand. People had not been buying consumer, car, consumer goods such as cars and all that for a while. You have GIs coming home that want cool little sports cars and that. And the American car companies were having to retool. You have to come up with new designs. You have to re -get, get your factory back reworked for car production rather than tank production and the like. So there's an opportunity. So you have another phase, just like at the beginning of the car, there's a new phase of new companies jumping into the market. And I have a few examples right here. First is the 1948 Davis Devan. This actually starts life as a design before the war. Frank Curtis, who is mostly famous for all his work with Curtis Craft building race cars, had also tinkered around with, with some other um, types of cars before the war. Joel Thorne, a race car driver of the day, had actually commissioned Frank Curtis to design a road-going car for him. That car was known as the Californian and would have looked very, very similar to this. The war comes along, though. Nothing really goes on with the car and all that. It's resurrected after the war when Gary Davis, a local salesperson, buys the design and decides he is going to turn it into a car that will take over the world, okay? His thought is that, look, this is a new era. We're into the future. We're into rockets. It's flying saucer days. It's all these things. We need a car that's looking ahead rather than looking behind. And this is what the future looks like, okay? It is an interesting vehicle. It is a three-wheel design, a tricycle design, although not very stable. Normally, if you do want a three-wheel car, you probably want your single wheel and back. But regardless, hey, here's an attempt for it that mirrors the Benz Pan and Motorwagen that started the whole industry in many ways. Since you have that, that single wheel up front, it allows you to get that nice aerodynamic looking right, front cone. You don't want headlights getting in the way of that, so this is an early use of hidden retractable headlights. This hard top is removable, so the whole thing could basically look like this bottom part. There are built-in jacks that if you do have a flat tire or something, you can just pop a lever and a jack will come down and you can jack it up. It's called the Davis Divan, Divan being the Arabic word for sofa because it basically is a driving sofa. Now, that opens up the idea, if you're trying to take over the car market, you need to be able to fit a family in. Gary Davis would drive it around uh, shopping mall parking lots and say, yep, sure thing, perfect for the family, and he would put four people in it. They happen to generally be um, four American Airlines flight attendants that would more easily fit in than maybe a standard size um, family of four. 
But regardless, the idea is that this is the future. And this is what he was trying to sell people on, is it's radically different looking because the future is different, okay? Now, he was a salesperson, and he could market it great. He had people lining up to be dealers for it, and he had promised all those investors, as well as employees, hey, I'll pay you all kinds of money once I sell about a million of these. Well, he wound up making about 16 of them. So, investors, employees, not the most happy with the deal, um, pursue legal action. He actually gets convicted of a couple dozen um, fraud counts and winds up spending a couple years up in Castaic at a, a work camp. He comes out though, and he does find a way of making millions and millions of dollars. Not selling Davis to Vans, but rather if you've ever been to a theme park and been inside a bumper car, over half of bumper car designs are Gary Davis originals. So you kind of see maybe where he got his design cues from. The same year Gary Davis was building the divan, someone else was out there thinking they could launch a car company in this economic market opportunity that has been created by the big producers having to retool and having a break. Preston Tucker is among those. Whereas Gary Davis was trying to envision the future and others were trying to build the new next sports car, Preston Tucker's focus was on safety. He thought cars, particularly as they were getting speedier and speedier and all that, were not as safe as they could be. So he wanted to develop a car that would be safe, okay? You have such things as the Cyclops headlight in the front that um, will turn with you as you steer. It's one of the first cars you could get with um, seat belts being standard. There was lots more padding around in the dash and the like, okay? For power, he actually went to the Bell Helicopter Company and got a air-cooled helicopter engine that his engineers actually converted or at least worked on converting to liquid cold, okay? The whole idea is, is that there's all kinds of things going in to make as safe a car as possible. And he's pushing the, the, the bounds of innovation at this time. Well, just like Gary Davis, he was pretty good at marketing it. He was selling it to people and getting dealers to sign up and everything else. But along the way, and there's some discussion over what exactly happened, he gets indicted for fraud. If you want to go down one path, it's because he had overpromised. All those people giving him money and signing up for exclusive dealerships and all that, he was not able to deliver the cars. Another side of the story is, is that this is when the big car companies eventually decided they didn't want the competition. So they limited his access to resources and everything else. I'm not here to make judgment on that, but the idea is, is that Preston Tucker gets indicted after 37 had been produced. The original goal had been to make 50. They wind up making 51, but the last 14, after he gets indicted after 37, are largely built by ex-employees and volunteers and all that that take what they have and put together as cars. One thing that makes this Tucker particularly special, you can see here with the Tucker family seal, this is one of Preston Tucker's Tuckers. So gives it a little bit extra panache. The last one I want to mention quickly here, it, I, it's one I, I debated about including all that because of what we mean by failure. This is a 1954 Kaiser Darren. Now, the companies involved may not have failed as spectacularly as, say, the Davis Motor Car Company, okay? Basically, Henry Kaiser had Kaiser Industries. He hooks up. Um, with the um, CEO of um, uh, Grand Page Motors in 1945 for them to start making cars, okay? And so you make cars for a while and everything else. Um, they had the, the Henry J that they sold. Um, that was also famous because it was sold within Sears, um, Sears stores as the Allstate. Well, in 1954, they decided they wanted a sports car. So they pair up with Dutch Darren, who's a California-based designer and the like, and the goal is to create a, a kind of innovative sports car. And the outgrowth is the Kaiser Darren 161. And it is innovative. This is the first production, American production car built all of fi fiberglass. The pocket doors, which if anyone's ever had one in their house, realize they're not the easiest to maintain, but it does give it a pretty sporty look and makes it easy to park in tight spaces. Okay? They wind up building a little bit less than 500 of these before they decide the costs are too high for the amount they're selling and the whole thing goes away and Kaiser's automotive company and all that also this year is going to go away 
when it's slowly picked apart and eventually becomes Kaiser Jeep, part of other companies. Now, if you follow me this way, This is gonna be another one of those cars that I kind of debated about and everything else because it's considered one of the most beautiful cars ever made. But the company was short-lived, so I think it's relevant for our discussion. This is a 1947 Chis Italia 202 Coupe. Much like we just set up with the American story, Italy had a similar story in that coming out of the war, everything needs to kind of retool. And what happened in Italy is you had a lot of industrialists and a lot of people and all that that just started scooping up Fiat parts that there were lots of around and trying to make their own car company out of. Piero Duzio was a fairly wealthy Italian industrialist who formed the company Compagnia Industriale Sportiva Italia, otherwise known as Cheese Italia. And he took his Fiat parts and in the case of the 202, actually had the resources to be able to go to Panin Farina, one of the most famous coach builders of the day, to create this very stylish body for it. It's considered one of the earliest attempts at designing a car as a unified whole. So many pre-war cars, you had a fender bolted to um, a hood, bolted to a cabin and everything else. It was all very distinct parts, but the cheese Italia is a single envelope. The entire body flows into one another. So it's, it's kind of setting the stage for what modern car design would look like. It was considered so beautiful that in 1951, the Museum of Modern Art in New York had an exhibit called Eight Automobiles that they featured what they considered eight, eight cars that really captured the beauty and the, could be considered as rolling sculpture. This is one of them. In the 70s, MoMA actually gets one of these donated by Panin Farina to be part of their permanent collection. So here I'm setting up the story that Duzio and Chis Italia were able to make one of the most beautiful cars a trendsetter for all automotive styling from this point forward. What happened? Porsche happened. One of the ways that Duzio wanted to build the Chiss Italia mark and all that is to build a super successful Grand Prix racer and dominate racing, okay? He contracts out with Porsche the development of the engine, gives them a whole lot of money. That is money that Porsche uses to get Ferdinand away from his legal troubles in France that had come out of the war. Well, all that money went to eventually coming up with the engine, which if you're a Porsche aficionado, this is the Type 360. But all that money got them an engine, but also basically bankrupted the company. So Chis Italia never really fully survived all of that financial boondoggle. The 202, though beautiful and striking, didn't sell enough to make up for that and so Chis Italia as a company is going to fade away. Now next is another one that I don't know if I can call it a failure as much because we aren't sure exactly what the grand plans would have been. But it is a limited run car that I can't add on a bunch of other cars by the producers, so it's close enough. It's a 1926 Pedroso. So the Marquis San Carlos de Pedroso was a former equerre for King Alfonso of Spain. And he had actually worked with Marquez Soriano in another car venture earlier in the 20s. Well, they had some issues with each other and kind of went their own way, but Pedroso kept tinkering in his garage and all that and thought he had a plan for a, the next phase of sports cars. He had some pretty interesting ideas. This is a early car using a straight eight engine. I know Bugatti had Harry Miller design straight eights early on in that, but this is a straight eight engine. But he went a little bit further than anyone else was doing is he put a double overhead cam on it and that was a variable time cam. There's actually gauges, um, dials that you can dial on the um, dashboard that allow you to control the timing of your car, which unheard of in the 1920s. He gets so excited about all this innovation he's doing and all this technology he's throwing in the car that he really wants to go out and test it, but he hasn't built the whole thing out. So he actually goes and grabs some wicker seats off his patio, puts some fabric over them, and that becomes the actual seating on the car. 
Okay. Now, here again, this is hard for me to label a failure because who knows what would have happened and everything else. There's no idea if he had grand plans of building a whole huge company with it and everything else. In the short term, only two were made. The other one doesn't survive World War II. So this is the only surviving Pedroso in existence. Now, as we're walking by many non-failures, right? We're going to wrap the corner. My next car I'm gonna throw in there because it didn't go anywhere, it could have. Um, but one thing is to view this car from is that this was a concept. If we were going to include all concepts in a list of failures, the industry would be riddled with them. There's all kinds of ideas that get floated that just for various reasons of circumstances or timing never get anywhere. But just so I'm not walking a whole lot without saying anything, I will bring up the Dodge Storm. So this is actually a fairly interesting car. This is a Fred Zader Jr. design. Fred Zader's dad, Fred Zader Jr.'s dad, Fred Zader, was one of the three musketeers who had been Studebaker engineers that Walter Chrysler brings over to Chrysler, and they're behind some of the early Chrysler designs and all that. Fairly important in automotive history. Well, Fred Zader's son, Fred Zader Jr., continues the tradition and works as a, a designer for, for Chrysler. This is the early 50s. We set up the story about how retooling and everything else, and un unsatisfied demand, there was a great push for the need for two-seat sports cars to satisfy all those returning GIs. Well, 1951, Nash comes out with the Nash Healy, really the first two-seat sports car by a fairly major American producer. 1953, you get the Corvette. 1955, the Thunderbird. So everyone's jumping into this market, except where, oh, where is Chrysler? The car in front of you would have been Chrysler's entry. This is a 1953 Dodge Storm Z250. Fred Zader Jr. design. The bodies were built by Bertone in Italy and actually shipped over to the US on the Andrea Doria, which is a ship that gains fame for other reasons later on. Well, I say bodies because there were two of them. This is the driving around road going body, but there was also a more racing oriented body that there are four bolts underneath the car that you can undo and switch your bodies out. By the time you factor in Italian design bodies that there are multiple ones of, plus the, some of the innovations under the hood and everything else, this wasn't the cheapest car to produce. And Fred Sater Jr. also didn't have a whole lot of corporate support for it. So the entire program goes away, and really, if you're looking for a Chrysler two-seat sports car, you really have to wait until the 90s when the Viper comes out for them to satisfy that market segment. Now we're going to wrap around the corner here. We will have a couple cars that are a little bit hard to see. When you have 250 cars stuffed into a garage, sometimes you have to stack them and everything else. Um, we're, we're making do with what we can, but there's some stories I just can't skip. So a lot of what we've talked about are car companies that came and went, right? That, that didn't stick around and all that. And I've mentioned some other things like the Dodge we just talked about. Not all the failures though are the companies that came and went. Some of them are the companies you know and love. Perhaps no car best embodies and has become synonymous for the thought of failure as the Edsel. The situation you have is in 1954, the Ford family, basically, Ford, goes, Ford does their IPO. So the Ford family's gonna lose their complete control over the company. You now have investors and stockholders and everyone else involved, okay? Well, 
they were looking at the market. And keep in mind, this is mid-50s when they're doing all this assessment. And what they started cluing into is that GM really had done a far better job at creating different, different levels of car to target different segments of the market, okay? And Ford said for a while, they always thought, oh, Lincoln is our version of Cadillac. But they started realizing by looking at the market that Lincoln was actually competing more with the Oldsmobile Buick levels and all that, and they didn't really have a serious challenger for Cadillac, okay? And they certainly didn't have as many of the mid and lower end market segments covered. So what do we do? So the plan was they were going to start tilting Lincoln to be more and more up market. This included for a couple of years, they actually spun off the Continental in terms of it being its own mark. The kind, and those, if those of you being watching the Vault Tours probably have seen our Continental Mark II. So Continental would be kind of the highest end and Lincoln right after it, that's for the high end market. But that's creating an opening now in the in intermediate market. If Ford and Mercury are targeting lower intermediate and lower entry level markets, who is really our challenger in that middle there? The idea was to create something new. And so they started a project called the E-Car Project with the E standing for experimental. Well, by the time they're getting ready to launch and all that, experimental E-Car is gonna become the Edsel. Edsels were marketed beyond imagination. Before there had been the first car rolling off the production line, Ford starts rolling out marketing for it about how the Edsel was going to be the car of the future. It was going to provide all the style and performance and comfort and everything you may want to hit those brand new American things the interstates with. Okay? It was really being propped up as the car that everyone would want. Some of that description and all that, to that intermediate sized car and everything else, worked well in the mid-50s when this was all being launched. But by the time Edsels are actually being produced, you're in the latter part of the 50s and the country is in recession. People are no longer as interested in an immediate type car, size cars. They want what's about to be called the compact, right? The Rambler American had already been out and you're gonna start seeing some other cars start filling in that smaller, more efficient vehicle size that people are actually looking at. You also throw in the fact that all that marketing had been setting up the Edsel as being style beyond belief, technology you've never seen before. It is truly the car of the future. And when it actually wheeled out, people are like, eh, right? It doesn't look that different than anything, right? It does look like every other red, red convertible out there in the 50s. And there wasn't anything really magical about its performance. So the Edsel lands with a thud and is basically done as a independent make by, uh, by 59, okay? But it has lasting effect because the Edsel name has, like I said, become largely synonymous with any type of failed product launch, for better or worse. Follow me this way. Another car that has gained a reputation as being a failure, um, rightly or wrongly, we'll, we'll kind of explore that a little bit here, is the Chevy Corvair. As I just mentioned, particularly after the 57, 58 recession, there was a increased interest in compact cars, smaller vehicles. The great big road monsters of the 50s were giving way to people focusing a little bit more on efficiency. Not quite to the extent you see in the 70s, but you are, you are, by the early 60s, starting to see some interest in smaller cars. Nash's Rambler American had kind of set the pace. That was the first truly compact American-built car. But you had along the way, by the late 50s, the Ford Falcon, the Plymouth Valiant. There were other cars that were beginning to enter that, that segment. GM needed something. And so their idea was the Chevy Corvair. Corvair from Corvette and Bel Air, two of its most famous models, the name being combined into one, because then you get the best of both worlds. Anyways, Corvair launches in 1960. And unlike the Falcon, the Valiant, which was basically just taking a standard design and downsizing it, Chevy actually went the extra mile and said, no, we're going to kind of shake up how we design cars and everything else. One of the most notable changes is they went to an air-cooled rear engine. 
right? Everyone loved Porsches of the day and everything else. Let's kind of copy their model. They also went for a independent suspension, including the rear tires being driven by swing axles. Now that too is a design they borrowed from Porsche and the like that had shown that it can work very well. That's what leads us to the questions. In 1965, Ralph Nader writes a book called Unsafe at Any Speed that is about the Chevy Corvair. He claims that swing axle design in the back led to completely awful handling and a huge surge in the amount of accidents. And there was some legal case to back it up. There were lawsuits out there about people shooting Chevy, Chevy about the Corvair. Well, this was a black eye that really the Corvair could never survive from. In 1965, they went from the first generation to this, which was a second generation Corvair. But by 69, the, the um, model is dead. Now, all in the follow-up to this, in the late 60s and early 70s, there were a series of Senate hearings and all kinds of assessment. And a lot of those have basically come out of it saying, nah, the Corvair really didn't have that many more problems than anyone else had, right? Yes, there were occasionally accidents, but every car occasionally gets in some accidents. And everyone started referring to the fact that there are all kinds of European car builders and all that that had used that same rear engine, swing axle, suspension design to, to no problem. Okay, so the Corvair may be one of the cars that was a failure in its day, but may have been unfairly targeted for any number of reasons. So it has become iconic and there are huge Corvair fan bases out there to this day. Now, for my last couple cars, we're actually going to sneak back into the, the storage areas of the vault. Okay, so there's one car I really needed to close this with. As we're walking towards it, I'll point out a couple. 1955 Fuji Cabin. Um, Japan, always interested in very small cars, very fuel efficient. This is one that only 85 sold of. So that would be considered one of the failures. Now, the car I really need to talk about is going to take some effort here for us to get past. So, I think you can get either side here. It's this yellow one in the middle here. This is the 1975 Dale prototype. The Dale is a, a very interesting car story. Whereas a lot of the ones we've looked at have became failures because of the market change or resources ran out or anything else, the Dale in many ways can be considered to be designed for failure. It was largely a con. A woman named Liz Carmichael in the mid 70s starts going out saying, I have the car of the future, which you've heard that phrase from me several times today. It tends to be attached to a car that becomes a failure. But in this case, it truly was um, a failure. So Liz Carmichael goes out and starts trying to get investment, promising the car of the future. It was a car that supposedly would get 70 miles to the gallon. And in the mid 70s, fuel efficiency was the major concern of a lot of people. It had a BMW motorcycle engine that for whatever reason, a lot of the documents they would share, the drawings they would share, it was mounted incorrectly. It had what she said was no wires because it, uses pr it used printed circuit boards all through the dash. Now, how those controls would actually carry through to the rest of the car, which normally requires wires, was never really clarified. But the idea is, is that Liz Carmichael may not have been a car designer, but she was an excellent salesperson. So anyways, she starts going out and eventually starts selling rights to dealerships and other securities that she had no permission to do. So that, coupled with the fact that her chief salesperson winds up getting murdered along the way, had drawn some law enforcement attention. So much so that she runs off to Texas and renames the Dale the Rivette and starts trying to market it again. Well, Texas authorities, aware of the story leading into this, issue a cease and desist order on her to shut down everything, and she basically disappears for a little bit. Well, Texas along the way discovers that Liz Carmichael, actually the woman that's off selling the Rivette or the Dale or whatever we want to call it at this time, actually had formerly been a man named Jerry Dean Michael, who had all kinds of charges for counterfeiting against them when they disappeared. So all of this starts coming together Eventually, Liz Carmichael, Jerry Michael, whoever is arrested. They're sentenced, they're convicted of counterfeiting and everything else, um, sentenced to 10 to 20 years, but wind up jumping bail and disappearing. 
Well, eventually, Unsolved Mysteries, the TV show, airs something about it, and someone discovers her in 1989 living in, and you won't believe this, Dale, Texas, where she is arrested again and goes to jail for 10 years. So excellent marketer. I forgot to mention back in its heyday, it was actually the final showcase prize on The Price is Right. Fortunately, the winner did not win the Dale and at that time would have, did not discover that it is largely made out of some wood here and there and that and never will have really been a functioning car. But hey, you at least got it under the lights. So anyways, we close with this, one of the, at times lesser known, but when you understand it, one of the best examples of failure in the history of the industry. Thank you all for joining me for this somewhat longer um, trip through the vault. We will have plenty of more content coming. Just keep, uh, keep your eyes on us.